and I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. And so we will begin in Psalm 23 first. There's a few ideas here that I want to show you. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Now let's stop there. Let's stop there for just a moment. The Lord is my shepherd. I want you to see how L O R D is capitalized. Lord. It's the it's the uh, Hebrew personal name of the God of Israel. Jehovah Yahweh the Lord. It's his personal name. And it's a beautiful thing. There are different words for the word God and Lord in Scripture. There is the Lord, which is Adonai, which means Lord. Then there's God, which is Elohim. But whenever you see Lord all in capital letters, the original um, Hebrew Bible points out that it is his personal name. Now, why is this important? The Lord is my shepherd. It doesn't say God is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Yes, it's God. We are speaking about God here. But it is a revelation of God as his personal, personal knowledge. It is the Lord himself. See, in Genesis chapter 1, we see God as creator, as Elohim. Amen. Jennifer just told me the House of Glory just reached over 1,000 subscribers. Amen. Praise God. Keep the subscriptions up so that we can uh, start the, the, the church's YouTube channel strong. Okay. Now, the Lord is my shepherd. In Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And we see all throughout Genesis chapter one, the word God, God created in the beginning. God did this. God said that God. And it was so there was evening. There was morning the first day, the second day. You see Elohim, the Lord, the, the God, the creator. But in Genesis chapter 2, in relation to man, the Bible says the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And that word Lord God there is the personal name of the Lord, the sacred name of the Lord, the God of Israel. In creation, he is creator. In creation with man, he is personal. Man was intimately designed, created and fashioned by the Lord to personally know him. The scripture teaches that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that we are made in his image, in his likeness, you see. And so we are made to relate to God in some way. And we see that in Psalm chapter 23, it's the same word, the Lord, the, the, the personal name, the sacred name, the personal name of the Lord. Don't get fixated on how you pronounce the name or how does this name, don't get fixated on the Israelite and the Hebraic name. That's not the point of the text. The point of the verse is to show you that he is personal. He is to be known. He is personified. You can know him personally. That is the point of, of why that's being conveyed there. And the uh, Hebrew writers and the Hebrew um, audience at that time understood that. They understood because they spoke that language that whenever these names were, related there was a revelation contained 
in, in what they were trying to convey, the writers. So while you're getting caught up in, should we call it, should we call him Yehovah or Yahweh or Jehovah? You're missing the point. That's not the point. The point is that he is personal. You see, personal. That's the point. The Lord is my shepherd. Notice he doesn't say the Lord is the shepherd. He says, no, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you see that? Personal, personal. The Lord is my shepherd. This personal God of Israel is my shepherd. You see that? He is mine. Now, what is, what, what is a shepherd? The scripture tells us, this is the Amplified Bible, a shepherd feeds, a shepherd guides, a shepherd protects. He's a shield with the sheep. And the Lord himself, God, is our shepherd. Do you know him personally? When you personally know him, you will know him as shepherd. He feeds you. He guides you. He shields you. And this is what the Lord is like. He is like a shepherd. He is your shepherd. He feeds you. He feeds you himself. He feeds you living bread. See, how the Lord feeds us is by his very being. Jesus refers to himself in the scripture as the bread, the living bread that came from above. He who feasts on me, he who feeds on me will never hunger. You see, the Lord himself is food for you. And out of his very presence and being comes his word and his very person. His presence. He nourishes us with himself. He guides us by himself. Not only does he feed you, but he guides you. He leads you in the way of truth. And he shows you what is false. He, he guides you to what is, is holy and reveals to you what is unholy. He leads you. That's what he does. And he shields you. He protects you from the power of sin, from the power of the powers of hell. He protects you from the wicked schemes of the devil. He is your shepherd. And then look what David says. I shall not lack. I shall not lack. Do you see that? You shall not lack. Why? Because he is your shepherd. He is everything. What is it that you need? Some people need money. Some people need this. Some people need that. Listen, you just need him. You're looking at all the other stuff. Look at him. He is your everything. And when you see him as your everything, you realize that you have no lack. Isn't that beautiful? And it says, he makes me lie down. Fresh in fresh, tender, green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. Revelation 7, 17. Now, here is something about the Lord as your shepherd. He makes you lie down. He causes you and leads you to lie down. What is that? Rest. He says, what does our shepherd king tell us? The Lord Jesus. He says, come to me, all who are weak and who are burdened with ladens, and I will give you 
rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. He makes you lie down. To lie down is a posture of rest. He makes you lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. What does that signify? Again, as a sheep, we are part of the sheepfold. He causes us to lie in rest and feast on freshness. His spirit is always refreshing. His spirit is like water. John 7, 37, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Holy Spirit, whom was not yet given, for Christ was not yet glorified, speaking of his death, burial, and resurrection, and the promise of the Holy Spirit to those who would believe in him. Everything that God does in your life, he will cause you to be refreshed. In Jeremiah, the second chapter, God speaks strongly to the prophet Jeremiah and speaks concerning the woes of the children of Israel. And he says, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot contain any water. See, God refers to himself as the fountain of water, the living water. Scripture tells us in the book of Psalms, for in you is the fountain of life, and in you do we see light. I believe that's Psalm 37. For in you is the fountain of life. Do you thirst? Come unto him and drink. He makes you lie down in fresh, green pastures. There is something that happens that when your heart becomes aware of him as shepherd, you begin to enter into rest. He makes you lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures, and he leads me beside the still and restful waters. Just the other day, I was thinking about this very passage, and I read a commentary that just blessed me. And I want to share it with you. During the time of King David, the, the hills and the pastures that he was referring to, if you go there today, they're arid, they're brown, they're, there's, there's hardly any greenery there. And there was a commentary that I was reading on that during those times, they had to cultivate and till that land and make it make it green because it wasn't naturally green. And so the sheep goes into a hillside that has already been pre-worked to become green. And all the sheep does is rest in that and feasts on that. And it's a beautiful typology of the finished work of Christ. He went to the hill called Golgotha. He ascended to the hill and purchased on that arid, dry, dead ground, your heart, your soul. And he causes life to form and he causes you to lie down in his finished pasture, in his finished work. You see that? So Jesus causes us to, to rest in the finished work of what he does. And look what he says here. He says, he leads me beside the still and restful waters, waters that are undisturbed, waters that are free from agitation, waters that are still peaceful. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us by his peace. Scripture tells us in the book of Colossians, let the peace 
of God rule and reign in your heart. He tells us in, in, in the scripture, let, let everything by prayer and supplication be anxious for nothing. Let by everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God and the God of peace will be with you. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding will be with you. Isn't that beautiful? He leads you by the still and restful waters. Verse three, he refreshes and restores my life. Another translation says he refreshes my soul or he restores my soul. In his presence, there's constant newness. In his presence is the fountain of life. There is refreshing and there's restoration in his presence. He refreshes and restores myself. In an age where we constantly live for affirmations and attentions, in an age where everything is public, in an age where we live from the outside in, God wants to touch us from the inside out. He wants to restore and refresh your inner self that has been born again of the Spirit. He leads you into the paths of righteousness. You see? uprightness and right standing with him. He's always going to lead you upward to the righteousness that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness and right standing with him, not for my earning it, but for his namesake. You are righteous, not for your earning it, but for his namesake. I heard it was said once that there was a teacher that went into Israel and was doing a tour. And he visited uh, some of the shepherd's fields and hillside. And he noticed that there was these little hoof prints that went all the way up to the hill, all the way up to the top. And he asked the shepherd, he said, what is that? He's like, oh, those are the little, uh, the hoof prints of the sheep. We call them paths of righteousness. The shepherds would call them that. That is to say that the shepherd always leads you upward. He leads you from glory to glory, from faith to faith. He always leads you up to Jesus. Your righteousness is upward. He calls us upward. And it's not for our earning, it's for his name's sake. The path of righteousness is the Lord Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is the pathway to righteousness. Not only is he the way, he's the truth, he's the life, he's the door, he's everything. Verse 4. He says, yes, though I walk through the deep and sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil for you are with me. Do you see this? Why are you afraid? Why are you scared? Fear and being afraid is not from the Lord. Even though you may be walking through the sunless valley of the shadow of death, it's only a shadow. It's a perception. Fear is false evidence appearing real. I will fear or dread no evil. For what? You are with me. Your presence is with me. Why should I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation, David says. Whom shall I be afraid? 
you are with me. You see that? Fear cannot exist in his presence. Fear is like the cold. The cold is the absence of heat. In his presence, fear dissipates. Fear is the absence of the awareness of the presence of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that he is truly with you. He's with you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd has a rod and the shepherd has a staff. What is the rod? It is to beat the wolves. It is to protect you. The Lord has a rod of protection and your staff, the shepherd's crook to guide. That is your comfort. You have guidance and protection in the revelation of Jesus as your shepherd. There's nothing to fear. The presence of the Lord, the love of God, swallows up fear. Verse 5. You, shepherd, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What is that? in relation to what does that mean you prepare before me a table in the presence of my enemies if you understand a little bit of the cultural background of the way that the kings of Israel did battle you'll understand that what they would do is they would go and conquer a city this is the culture of the Middle East. They would go in and they would conquer a city. They would plunder it and spoil and take all the spoils and all, the, all of the things. And one of the things that they would do, they would take the enemy, the opposing king, and they would chain him up and they would chain him against a wall and they would cause him to starve to death. And the king of the opposing battle would sit in the presence of his enemies and eat. The enemy was starving and it was a form of ridicule against the enemy. And what we see here is the Lord Jesus did the same thing. He prepared a table for you in the presence of my enemies, of your enemies. What did he do? Jesus' broken body became a table and he died in the presence of your enemies he disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us he told us in his word take eat of it every one of you this is my flesh speaking of his body take this drink this every one of you this is my blood speaking of the cup the table of the Lord is found in his broken body and blood given for you and for me. That is the table of the Lord that you are invited to. You now must understand that he prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. So what is it? You must eat him and drink him. He is the table. The Lord Jesus is your food. Not only is the Lord Jesus bread and wine, 
and the communion of your consummation. But he is also the very table, for he laid his life at the altar of the sacrifice of the cross. And as you consume him, you are, you are eating in the presence of your enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My brimming cup runs over. In the presence of the shepherd, he anoints your head. I've said this many times on the stream. If you look, if you look at, um, if you live in a farm or you've been to a farm, you'll know um, listen, you'll know that when you see sheep, how many of you have ever been to a, sh a farm? If you've been to a farm, you'll notice that a farm kind of smells funny. And what you'll notice is when you see sheep, many times you'll see flies and the flies are all over the crust of their eyes and on their nose and on their ears. It's kind of gross. And a way to remedy that is oftentimes a shepherd would take oil, olive oil, and they would, they would put it over a sheep's head and it would drip everywhere. And what they would do is they would rub it, that oil against the inside of their ears, the sheep's ears, and all over their eyes and on their nostrils and on their mouth. Every opening of their face, the shepherd would take oil and anoint them. And the reason why they would do that is it created a protective barrier against the flies from putting in larva in the ears, in the eyes, in the nose, and in the mouth. What am I saying? That in the presence of the shepherd, the Holy Spirit anoints you with fresh oil. That he protects you from your eyes, your ears, your, your mouth. He protects you and creates a barrier between you and the things that are unclean in this world and the devils that are, that are trying to put their larva in your eye gates and your ear gates and your sense of discernment and what you're saying. One title of the devil is called the Lord of the Flies. In the scripture, in the New Testament, Jesus refers to the devil as Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. Unclean things. When you're in the presence of the shepherd, the Holy Spirit is put on you as oil, as fresh oil, and there is a protective barrier. Some of you are saying, you got to help me. I'm, you know, there's so many thoughts. There's so many intrusive thoughts. You got to help me. You know, the devil's after me, blah, blah, blah. Listen, get in the presence of the shepherd. I need this. Get in the presence of the shepherd. Get in the presence of the shepherd. In the Holy Spirit will cause a protection to come over you, over all of the lies of the enemy. And he won't be able to take his filthy larva and put it in what you're seeing and hearing and, and speaking. And he says, you anoint my head with oil, my brimming cup runs over. What is a cup? A container. A container, a cup. He brings you to fullness. The overflow of the anointing, the overflow of his presence in your life causes your cup to be run over. And you will live in a state of overflow, spiritual overflow, where everything around you gets soaked and saturated 
with God. And I don't think it's a coincidence between the anointing my head with oil and your cup running over. Because there is over and over in scripture, oil and wine are always, they are many times mentioned together. In the book of Joel, oil and wine. Wine and oil are mentioned in the gospels as well. Oil and wine. When you are covered in the anointing of the Spirit, you have the new wine of heaven and you run over. There's an overflow. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 6, Surely only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And through the length of my days, the house of the Lord and in his presence shall be my dwelling place. Isn't that beautiful? If you can, please like the stream. It really does help quite a bit. And don't forget to subscribe to our new uh, church plant, House of Glory. Amen. I want to say also thank you for the new members. Lisa just became a member. Graham Lambert just became a, a member. Michael Envildelson, I hope I said it right. Thank you for becoming a member. Shout out to Brandon Chambers, Sandy. Praise God. So many members coming in. Your membership goes to LG. Thank you so much. Your membership actually helps us, my, my family. We are doing this full time. And so your YouTube membership is supporting my family and I to keep focusing on the ministry. Amen. So thank you so very much. The scripture says that a worker is worthy of his wages. And so I'm depending on the Lord to, um, to provide and thank you for the for you yielding to that and if the lord puts it in your heart feel free to do that there's no pressure and there's no obligation at all amen okay so let's um go to the second thought let's go to the second thought um yeah, Vicky said, did you start a new church? Yes, I did. We planted and pioneered a new work. And someone just asked, Thomas, how do I become a member? Uh, Jen Cruz will give you a link on how to become a member. Jen, maybe if you can provide the link there and I'll pin it, that would be great. Okay. The second thought, the second thought that I want to convey to you is this, that Jesus is your bridegroom. Jesus is our bridegroom. Yes, Jesus is our shepherd. Yes, he provides for us. He leads us. Let me go ahead and just pin this here, guys. All right, I went ahead and so see it's pinned there it is just click on that link there okay all right i pray that this breakdown of psalm 23 was a blessing to you let me tell you the second thought jesus as our bridegroom but before i do i want to give you a little testimony okay I want to give you a little testimony. I think it was last week. It was last week. My wife was in Dallas. And um, I was with the kids, you know. Basti, thanks for becoming a member. God bless you. And 
as I was laying down, it was about maybe seven in the morning or so. And I was awakened. I just woke up. And as soon as I woke up, I felt the beautiful presence of the Lord. My little daughter was laying down and I was just looking at her. And as the sun was rising, I could see the sun rising from the reflection of the window. And as the sun was rising, I can feel the Son of God rising in my heart to minister to me. And I felt the beautiful presence of Jesus. And I had to grab my cup of coffee and I went outside and in the silence, in the stillness of the morning, just at the breaking of the dawn, as the sun was rising, I was caught up in the presence of Almighty God. And I began to sing songs of adoration to Him in Spanish. I love singing songs in Spanish. And I remember as I was worshiping, tears began to stream down my face. And the Lord Jesus kept showing me Him as our bridegroom, him as the lover of our soul, and we, the church, as his bride. And after my moment with the Lord, it was just such a beautiful time. It was such a beautiful time in his presence that I didn't want to leave. I just spent a good hour just there, just loving on the Lord and singing songs in Spanish. One of my favorite artists is an artist by the name of Marcus Brunet. Uh, he sings a lot of powerful songs in Spanish. And when I finished praising the Lord, when I finished worshiping the Lord, I go back into my home and I go to the restroom to wash up. And right there, the presence of Almighty God came upon me again, almost like an embrace. And I wasn't even expecting it. And his embrace began to speak to me. You see, the Spirit of God bore witness with my spirit. Again, that reality. We must make ourselves ready. And I thought of Revelation chapter 9, verse 17. I mean, 7. Revelation chapter 19, excuse me, verse 7 where it says, let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage uh, supper of the Lamb has come and the, the wife of the Lamb, the church, has made herself ready. And I believe that in this final hour, in these last days, <clears throat> excuse me, the Spirit is going to pour out such a powerful revelation of Jesus as our bridegroom and the church as his bride. Revelations ends with the spirit and the bride say come. At the coming of the Lord Jesus, the spirit and the bride say come. I am firmly convinced that the greatest revelation for the church in these last days is behold your bridegroom comes and we must make ourselves ready and so that idea that revelation came to me through the word of god and i felt such a glory of god that it was uncontainable. It was like so beautiful, so precious. I knew him in a different way at that moment. As a deep and intimate lover of our soul. And so let me give you 
some scripture here. And then after this, we're going to have our after stream party for all of our YouTube members. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. I keep saying 9, 19, excuse me, verse 7. It says as follows. It says, let us rejoice and shout for joy, exalting and triumph. Let us celebrate and ascribe him glory and honor. For the marriage of the lamb at last has come and his bride has prepared herself. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He says, the marriage of the lamb at last has come. He's speaking of the final moment when we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the scripture says, she has been permitted to dress in fine, radiant linen, dazzling and white purity for the fine linen signifies or represents the righteousness the upright just and godly living deeds and conduct and the right standing with god of the saints and the angel said to me write this down blessed happy to be envied are those who are summoned invited and called to the marriage supper of the land and he said to me further, these are the true words, the genuine and the exact declarations of God. There's coming a day where we're going to be quickened to meet the Lord and we will know him in this way. And so we've got to have revelation on Jesus as our, as our, as our bridegroom. When Jesus comes into the scene in his ministry in Israel when he was on the earth. He referred to himself as bridegroom. He says, why do your disciples not fast? But why do you and your disciples, they don't fast, but John's disciples fast. And he says, the bridegroom is with them. The bridegroom cannot mourn. And when the days are coming that the bridegroom will be taken from them and then there will be mourning and fasting. See, Jesus refers himself and also John the Baptist as the bridegroom. And it's symbolic. It's symbolism for the deepest expression of love and union the deepest expression of love and union between human beings are two bodies becoming one in marriage. The deepest expression of our fellowship with God is they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with the Lord. We are called to be betrothed to the Lord Jesus. We are called to say no to all of the other lovers of this world. Lovers of idolatry, the lovers of greed, the lovers of the self, the lovers of the flesh, the lovers of immorality, the lovers of idolatry. All of these things we are called to divorce from. And we are called to be betrothed to the Lord Jesus. When you said yes to Jesus, you say, I do to you. And I say no to all others. It is him that we are betrothed to. Let me show you this passage. And then I want to talk to you about my trip to Orlando that's taking place. February the 25th. But let's finish this passage here. Ephesians chapter 5.
I want you to see Paul's exhortation in marriage. And I want you to see how Jesus is seen in the symbolism of marriage with our symbolism to our union with Jesus. <clears throat> it says this, Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 onward. It says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as service or worship to the Lord. For the husband is the head of of the wife as Christ is the head of the church himself the savior of his body so look he's taking the the symbolism of marriage and reflecting a greater reality of Christ and the church look what he says for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church Christ is the head of the church the church is the wife, or yes, it is It is the bride, himself the savior of his body. As the church is subject to Christ or submissive to Christ, so let the wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. And then look at the exhortation to the husbands. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See, a lot of guys are like, wife, you need to be submitted to me. Wife, you need to listen to what, I well, let me tell you something, man. When's the last time you've laid your life down for your spouse? You want your wife to respect you and submit to you. When was the last time you gave yourself up for her? Are you submitted to Christ? Have you given yourself to your spouse? Selfless. Husbands, love your wives. Look, as Christ loved the church, Jesus tenderly loves his bride and gave himself up. He literally gave himself up for us. Look at what verse 26 says. So that he might sanctify her so that he might make her holy having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word what do we see here jesus gave himself up for the bride so that he might sanctify or set her apart or make her pure and holy having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Jesus, when he gave himself up for us, shed blood and water out of the sleeping Adam, out of the side of his rib, came forth Eve, his wife. And out of the side of our blessed Lord Jesus, the last Adam, out of the rib or side of Christ came water and blood and the birth of his wife, the church, the new Eve. He washed us with the water of his word that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and faultless. Holiness, 
faultlessness, without spot or wrinkle, comes from the offering of the Lord Jesus. And Him doing this and separating you to Himself, the aim goal of that is to present you and I to himself in glorious splendor. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus offers himself for you. Jesus sanctifies you. Jesus makes you holy. Jesus washes you in the water of the word. Jesus removes the wrinkles. Jesus removes the spots for himself, for you. Isn't that beautiful? I've heard it was preached so many times. Church, you better get ready. You better you better have no spot. You better have no wrinkle. You can't remove the wrinkles. You can't remove the spots. It is only Jesus that does the work through the washing water of the word. Get baptized in the word of God and allow his word to wash you, to continually cleanse you. Have you ever heard of this statement? Do not be unequally yoked. What does that mean? It means to be unequally yoked is to be in two different levels, two different realities. An unbeliever with an unbeliever being together is unequally yoked, right? The Lord Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit and his word so that we become equally yoked with him in marriage in union with him. And I love, I want you to see something. I want you to see this last thing here, I'm going to say. Even so, husbands should love their wives as being, in a sense, their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Jesus loves you as much as he loves himself. Let that sink in. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it as Christ does the church. Christ cherishes and nourishes us with himself as our shepherd. Isn't that powerful? Because we are, verse 30, members, parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But this mystery is very great, very great. But I speak concerning the relation of Christ in the church. Do you see that? This mystery is very great. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and they shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The son left everything behind and betrothed himself to his bride. We say the same thing. We have left Adam and Eve, our earthly parents, to be betrothed to the new man, the Lord Jesus. Powerful revelation and reality. Jesus is our soon bridegroom, coming king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, allow the Lord to just speak to your heart through the word of God today. I pray 
that this has been a blessing to you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our YouTube channel. I am so very excited that you have decided to join this channel. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we live stream at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. That's 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We spend time in the presence of the Lord. We spend time just getting to know the Lord, worshiping Him together as a community, and doing some reflections on how to strengthen your prayer life. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to check out this YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel, and don't miss it. I look forward to seeing you on Fresh Oil. God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.